All right. Hello and welcome to the last, actual last Expert Insight interview of 2019. And I'm delighted to be joined by Greg Ward, who is just like me here is in San Diego. How are you doing, Greg? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. And this is, as usual, John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And Greg is a keynote speaker and he's been running this uh, consulting training and coaching firm serving industries and government for over 25 years, experiential learning, guided interactive facilitation, and even professional theater performance. So that's quite the mix. Yes, it, uh, I was able to blend my uh, original training in theater with uh, using that in training programs on emotional intelligence, working with people, even sales. Yeah. And that's what we're here to talk about today is how to become a trusted and respected advisor for life. Okay, so so Greg, so we always hear, you know, people talk about, oh, I want to become that trusted advisor. And trusted advisor has always, always been held up as this holy grail for, <laughs> for salespeople and all that. And to be honest, I don't think a lot of people really know what that means to begin with. And I don't think they know how to quantify when they have actually become a trusted advisor. I think you're absolutely right. I think w one of the things we have to understand about being that respected, trusted advisor is that respect and trust are not logical, cognitive thought processes. They don't come out of rational thinking. They actually come out of a much deeper, more primitive part of our brain called mm -hmm. the reptilian brain. So when you and I begin to interact with each other, if my reptilian brain gets signals from you that basically tell me, oh, this is someone who makes me feel good. In other words, my brain releases a hormone called oxytocin. You may have heard of it mm -hmm. called yep. the love hormone. If you treat me in a way that my brain doesn't perceive you as a threat, then I'm going to start to begin to respect and trust you because I have this little hit of oxytocin uh, flowing through my body and it makes me feel good. And uh, so if that happens over time, you keep treating me in a way that I consider respectful and I keep mm -hmm. getting this little oxytocin, uh, over time I'll eventually trust you and respect you and listen to what you have to say. But it has nothing to do with me rationally thinking, oh, he's treating me in a respectful, trusting manner, right. therefore I trust him. No, it's not about that at all. It's much more of a gut, um, primitive feeling. And and I guess a lot of that is to do with the consistency of how you interact, right? Because if I'm one way at the beginning and then I change a little bit and then maybe I'm, I'm a different, maybe I'm different even when I email you or whatever it is, I guess the consistency plays a big part in that kind of gut trust, right? It, it really does. It, I think the, the most important uh, thing for people who do what we do, and uh, as much as I'm a consultant and advisor and executive coach, I have to sell my services sure. every single day. And what I have found is if, if I treat people in a uh, generally respectful way, in a way that they want to be treated, for example, uh, I, I'm, I made the assumption, which I shouldn't have, uh, John, mm -hmm. when we started, of did you want to prefer to be called John? You may not prefer to be called John. You may pre prefer to be called by your last name or some other moniker. I should have asked you, and, and that would have been me showing you respect in a way that uh, you would say to yourself, oh, well, he cares about how I care about being addressed. So that's a tiny little thing that I could keep doing and checking in with you. Is this okay with, with you, John? And do I have your permission to go here? And so on and so forth. If I keep doing these little tiny things that demonstrate to you that I'm interested in you and I value what you value and I'm willing to hear what your needs are and what you want from me, then you are much more likely over time to trust me. And of course, you're right. I have to do this on a consistent basis. And I think you, you bring up a couple of interesting points here that I wanted to focus in on because I, I, I do, I believe very strongly in this idea of of being polite and respectful and mannerly. And I think that, unfortunately, we live in this culture now where 
being overly familiar, being really casual, being all of this stuff is it's being promoted as, oh, that's the way you want to communicate people. Right. So like the first time I write to you, I don't even know you. And it's been like, hey, Greg, you know, blah, blah. And, and for me, it's just nobody's ever going to or they're going to start off at a deficit with me, to be honest, when they start with that, because I mean, I, I look at it as. Would I walk up to you in the street, never having met you before, and just start, "Hey, Greg, yeah, you yeah, know," and be all? Uh, I'm, I wouldn't, obviously. I'd um, freak out. I'm like, "What? Who yeah, is this guy?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'd be saying, "Oh my goodness." Yeah. But yet, but yet, people have uh, people have latched onto this, and everybody is like, and when I even correct people and say, "No, no, don't be that, don't be that familiar from the get go. Be much more formal and respectful." That they like look at me as if I'm a dinosaur. Right. I, I think the. The watchword we heard over the past uh, 10 or 15 years is being authentic. Mm -hmm. And that's a trap. Uh, I call it the authenticity trap. Because uh, which authentic self are we going to be? That <laughs> unconscious kind of rude, kind of uh, just sort of informal kind of self? Is that who we're going to be? Or mm -hmm. are we going to be our best authentic selves? The ones that are respectful, the ones that give people their space, the ones that don't touch us when we don't want to be touched. Yeah. So what is our best authentic self? So when, when people say, oh, just be yourself, you have to be careful. You have to be your mm -hmm. best self. And, and that means yeah. treating people in a way that they consider respectful. Yeah, no, I, and I love that one too, because that's another one of the ones I always say is when people say like, be yourself. And I go, well, be yourself. If yourself is something that's good and respectful and nice, but don't be yourself if you're not. Like be, right. try and be someone else, try and be a better, as you say, your better self or try and be someone else, quite frankly, because <laughs> what you're putting forward ain't that great. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So at the end of the day, a lot of people, especially who, who I, I work with in sales, as you do, mm -hmm. they say to me, give me the tips, give me the techniques. And uh, I, I, one of the first things I say is, well, ask them what they want to be called. Yeah. What, the first name, last name, what, what do they prefer? And, and then get a sense of uh, feel out there. If you're in, with them in person, feel out their uh, personal space. Do, do, are they okay with you being in their space or do they need mm -hmm. more distance, more space? And and that that's not something you can ask, but you've got to be able to feel that out and sense it. Sense it. And, and so that's a level of emotional intelligence that I think all people involved in sales have to have is just turn on those six senses, turn on that, that the, the radar and, and try to get a sense of what's going on with your person. L look at their eyes, look at their face, listen to what they say, listen to the tones in their voice and, and try to, they say, imitate those. And, and I know that imitation can be uh, considered somewhat um, unflattering. But when I say imitate it, if, if someone is is being overly reticent with you, well, take that mm -hmm. as a cue. M yeah. Maybe they're feeling intimidated by you, so pull back. Or if they're being overly aggressive with you, that's likely you've been too aggressive, and so they're pushing back against you. So there's this sense, you have to turn the switch on yeah. of how to read and sense what's going on with other people. Because if you don't, if you just start parroting your stuff and going into your pitch, it's just like they use car sales, but after a while people mm -hmm. just turn off and they say, screw it, I, I don't trust this guy, I'm out of here. Yeah, no, and I think that's, a, again, I think it's a, it's a great point to go uh, that you're, that you're uh, saying here about really listening and understanding and observing people, because I think we've gotten away from observing people, we've certainly got away from listening. And, and I think, <laughs> you know, well, I mean, I think we that's have so true. It, it's so easy now for we, we've become so used to just reacting that we don't really listen anymore. Uh, but the, the, the another interesting point there is, uh, also with communication, I mean, it's respectful uh, to communicate to the person how they want to be communicated to. I had a great example. Somebody told me recently they were doing a ride along with the salesperson and the salesperson got a text from their prospect, right? And the prospect just asked a quick question in the text. Instead of texting them back, the salesperson immediately called them. And it turned out that person didn't want to be called. They wanted them to reply with the text. It was a simple question. They didn't want to call. They just wanted, and 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 he turned kind of to the salesperson and said, "Look what you just did there. The person just gave you a cue how they wanted to be communicated with, and you decided that you were going to communicate them with them a different way." Yep, and and um, probably that little mistake 
Mm -hmm. uh, at least made it much harder for them to go forward with, with that relationship or possibly that was the end of it altogether. Yeah. And I think to your point, I mean, it's easy to ask permission. He could, uh, all he, he, what, the, what the person could easily have done is saying, here's the answer. Would you like me to call you to discuss it further or is this enough? Mm. Right? Yeah. There you go. Beautiful. That's an easy, easy way to handle it. And it's respectful. Yeah. And then you get the opportunity, the person might say, oh, OK, no, actually, you can give me a call. But but again, like you were saying, with the if you're if you're not reading the person, if you're if you're being too much of something or too little of something, you're going to you're going to uh, engender a, a, re a reaction. Right. Long time ago, I had a financial advisor who I no longer work with. You know, his advice wasn't particularly bad. It's just that every time he contact, he over contacted me, he over communicated it. He was always connecting with me on my birthday and my anniversary and things like that. And, and I, I get it that he was trying to keep a strong relationship, but in all honest, all honesty, I never ever felt that he had my best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. I think he had his own best interests at heart. And that's essentially why I let him go. Yeah, and and it gave you the sense. I, I'll bet it gave you the sense that you were just popping up on his tickler list. Oh, Greg's birthday, better send him something or whatever. And and you know that's and that just makes you feel like yeah, you're just another one, and you're just in a process, and that's it. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly. And I gave him a lot of business. And after a mm -hmm. while, I at the end, of, I just said, I just don't honestly think you're in it for me. You're in it for you first, and then you're in it for me. And he kept denying that was true. And maybe it wasn't true, but mm -hmm. I felt it. Yeah. That's, that's how I felt. So no matter what he could have said or done, I, my mind was made up. I, I had unconsciously become biased against him until it became conscious. And I realized I don't want to work with this person anymore. So what are some of the ways that you can tell that uh, you are starting to become a, a trusted advisor or, or a, a respected trusted advisor? How, how can you tell that, that the process is heading in the right direction? When they're asking for your help, when, mm -hmm. when they're turning to you, rather than you always asking the question, they're, they're turning around and saying to you, well, this is something that's on my mind. Do you have some thoughts on this? Can you give me your advice? Can you give me your recommendation? That is truly when you can say, okay, I now have someone who feels like they trust me because they're seeking out my advice. Now, uh, I've had many clients, as I'm sure you have, who are seeking out free advice and free <laughs> consultation. <laughs> and you know what? I'm okay with that. I give it. Mm -hmm. I give it anyway. And I just prefaced it. I said, this is free advice. It may work for you. It may not. I'm happy to give my recommendation. I'm happy to give my advice. And that's fine. Uh, I come from a place of uh, abundance. Uh, yes. I, I feel that uh, uh, giving to others, uh, giving of my expertise, giving of my, my advice, regardless of whether or not they're a client, regardless of ability to pay, will come back to me in a good way. I, I don't believe that my the work I do is transactional and you have to give me something because I give you something. I don't operate that way. I just try to give as much as I can to everybody I can and do it as do it at, at my level of expertise. And it seems that the universe is rewarding me with being referred all the time and people asking for my advice and recommendation and also hiring and contracting me to serve as an advisor, trainer, consultant, and executive coach. So, so far, mm -hmm. knock on wood, it has worked for me and that's what I'm going to stick with. Well, and I think that's another important thing for people to take away. I think an abundance mindset is a very liberating one because basically it tells you that there's a, there's plenty out there. You know, if Greg is getting a load of business, it's not he's not taking it away from me. Uh, right. It's it means that there's plenty of business there for me as well. I just got to go find my find my own. But I think that's I think when you get into that uh, finite mindset where you think everything is finite and there's only so much. Um, that's when you can, you know, that's when you can, you know, you can really kind of get, get a little cutthroat and, and despairing and all of that. But if you have an abundance mindset, it's, it's much more liberating, right? I, I think you're absolutely right. I, and I, on the other hand, I completely understand. Let's say you're in the telecommunications industry, mm -hmm. you're in cell phones. 
I, the market is so bloody saturated now, mm-hmm. and it's so cutthroat, and and the margins are so thin. I can understand how heads of sales at these different companies are just absolutely tearing their heads out, a hair out, trying to figure out how do I beat the competition. And they truly do see the world as a, as a, a, a definite pie, which is mm-hmm. divided up between these players. I totally get that. Um, I'm not in that position. I, I think the, my world anyway, there's plenty of business out there. Uh, I just have to seek it out and and demonstrate that I'm the right guy to trust and and respect. Yeah, and uh, no, and I agree. I mean, obviously there are there are um, situations like that, but I think also that let's face it, I mean the markets keep growing, so so there's so it's not like there's there's shrinking you know shrinking markets. They're they're growing markets. So. Um, and I think sometimes then you have to, uh, you know, look at the industry or whatever you're in and saying, yeah, maybe this one is reaching saturation. Maybe I need to go to one that has more greenfield opportunity for me. But I think the world is, there's still so much opportunity in the world. But I, I'd like to get back to, um, before we finish, the, you know, just the concept of, of respectful, right? Because I really do think that that is something that is running a little bit counter to the to the popular pervasive culture that we exist in today um, so why do you think being respectful is is so critically important and if people were to adopt one thing in 2020 what do you think a a a return to being more respectful could do for them well i i think it's a wonderful question and thank you for asking uh, it, I think in today's world, what most of us are seeing and experiencing is more disrespect. Mm -hmm. And all the research that's being done is showing that more and more of us are feeling disrespected almost on a daily basis, either at work or at home or out in our communities. So what the research also tells us is that if you treat people in ways that they consider respectful, Respect is in, infectious, and they will re, return the respect towards you, and they will also return it towards others. It's mm-hmm. the altruism concept. It, 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 there's an old, uh, there's been a lot of research done, and there's an old parable about if you're in line and you see a homeless person, and the person in the car in, in front of you gives a um, yeah. that homeless person uh, a donation of some t- of some kind, you are actually more likely to give that person a donation as well. So altruism is infectious, and so is respect. And so, if there's one thing I would I would want to encourage people to do is is dial it back, dial back on the aggressiveness, dial back on the disrespect. I know we're, we're being bombarded by disrespect daily. It's coming from the media and from our family and from politicians and so on and so forth. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. What does it hurt you to treat people a little bit more respectfully than you normally do? What mm-hmm. does it hurt? It actually helps. You'll feel better. They'll feel better. A simple hello, how are you, and meaning it, a simple, I hope you have a good day. I hope you feel better. Uh, I, I wish you and your family the best. Uh, those little things, what I call regular respect, I don't see enough of these days. Or people do it in an offhand kind of flip way. They just say, have a good day. And, and they don't really mean it. But sometimes if you say it like you mean it, it will mean the world of difference to the person on the receiving end. So that's what I'm recommending people do. Just dial up the respect and dial back the disrespect. And I think, uh, and uh, to be honest, uh, as unfortunate as this is, I think uh, if you do the, if you do that, and particularly, I mean, you should do that anyway in your life. But if in sales you do that, it's unfortunate that you're going to stand out. You're going to stand out immediately, uh, and you're going to look a little bit different. So even from that point of view, uh, but it's a, it's the right thing to do. But it's also going to make you stand out. And the other thing I would just say too, on the other, on the flip side, to to prospects, uh, to people who salespeople contact, right? Just if there's one thing that I would employ you to do in 2020 is if you're not going to purchase from somebody, tell them. Just tell them. Just reply to that last email and say um, it's not a good fit right now. But just don't do this thing where you go silent and leave that I poor know. salesperson leaving you messages and emails and then telling their boss, oh, "I don't know, they've gone quiet on me." Just tell them. Tell them the truth. I agree with you a hundred percent. I can't tell you how many times I put in 
tons of hours on a proposal mm -hmm. and then heard nothing back. Absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. I, I'll follow up with a few emails and phone calls and then hear nothing back. And, yeah. and it's like, really? Really? You, 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 mm -hmm. you don't have time or is it that you just don't want to say? And it's exactly. not that hard. I, I'm sure you get this all the time, John. People yeah. on LinkedIn, they want to connect with me yeah. and tell me how they can uh, 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 optimize my SEO and all this kind of stuff. I always reply. I say, thank you for the opportunity to connect. I just want you to know I'm happy to connect, but my marketing and my SEO needs are all taken care of. If you'd still like to connect, please let me know. Mm -hmm. I do that regardless of who it is. Sometimes it's a little bit, takes a lot of time. I get two or three a day sometimes, but I, I, feel, I feel better for it. I feel like I've re been respectful. And oddly enough, once in a while, the person comes back and says, thank you for letting me know, Greg. Yes, I'd, yeah. like, to, I'd like to connect anyway, if that's okay with you. And then we have a, a mutually respectful relationship, whereas the other way, nothing, no one's served. Yeah. I know. No, it isn't. And, and I hear beliefs our poor salespeople all the time, you know, saying like, oh, you know, I don't know, we were, we were communicating and now they just said nothing. That's funny. And actually today I had to, I sent one of those emails to somebody to say, listen, yeah, the solution isn't for us right now. Sorry about that. But thank you for presenting all the information and came back and said, oh, really, thanks very much for letting me know. I mean, that's great because now that that salesperson isn't wondering is that still an opportunity or wasting their time constantly chasing after it give it's 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 beneficial to both of you and it doesn't take much effort no and and or even worse that salesperson thinks to themselves huh who do they think they are they didn't respond to me and they get this <laughs> exactly. negative bias against you in their minds so what does it what does it take to just respond if you're so darn busy then you probably have an assistant ask your assistant yeah, to respond exactly. <laughs> exactly. So let's uh, so let's end on this one. Let's dial up the respect on the sales side. Let's dial up the respect on the buyer side and life will be beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. Thank you, John. <laughs> okay. Well, before we go, Greg, you tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. And, uh, and obviously you have a, a few books, books out as well. I do. Thank you. I am a trainer and speaker and author uh, on uh, respectful leadership and emotional intelligence, and I help leaders and their organizations transform uh, their way of being into one which is more respectful. And as a result, we found that uh, most organizations really true benefit from having respectful leadership cultures. And my book that came out in 2016 is called The Respectful Leader. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. I'm very proud to say that it is a bestseller, and it also won uh, a gold medal for Best Business Fable uh, in 2018. And uh, mm -hmm. it's a quick read. You can read it in a couple hours on an airplane, and most people have said they've really enjoyed my book. So you can find that at respectfulleader.com. And uh, you can get in touch with me, with me through that website and also through my company website, gregwardgroup.com. And that's Greg with two Gs at the end. It's all my mother's fault. Uh, G-R-E-G-G <laughs> Ward, W-A-R-D group.com. Thanks again, John. Excellent. And thanks, Greg, with two Gs. And uh, we'll see you for another expert insight interview real soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.